Chapter Thirteen of The Rover Boys in Camp by Arthur M. Winfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Thirteen: The Fight at the Boat House. Inside of a week, the newly elected officers felt perfectly at home in their various positions. Captain Putnam's idea of allowing only such cadets to be candidates as could fill the positions properly had borne good fruit and the battalion was now in better condition than ever before contrary to general expectations larry colby as major proved a strict disciplinarian when on parade in the playground he was as chummy as ever but this was cast aside when he buckled on his sword and took command this is as it should be was captain putnam's comment and it is the same throughout life play is play and business is business as a captain dick was equally successful and tom also made a good second lieutenant company a was speedily voted superior to the others when drilling and when on the march and consequently became the flag-bearer for the term this is splendid said dick when the announcement was made and then he went at company a to make the cadets drill and march better than ever but though the students gave considerable time to military matters they were not permitted to neglect their regular studies and to their honor it be it said that the three rover boys pitched in with a will if i can't be an officer i'm going to be a high-grade student anyway said sam and kept his word books suited him better than did military glories and soon he was at the top of his class in almost every branch of learning many of the cadets were anxious to know where the annual encampment would be held but for the time being captain putnam declined to discuss the subject we will talk about that as soon as lessons are done for the term said he i don't believe we'll go to briar grove again said powell to dick a farmer has built a house up there and is clearing off the land as fast as he can i wish we could go to some place at a distance returned dick all of us know this territory pretty well i like to visit new localities so do i during those days the rover boys received a letter from their father which proved unusually interesting anderson rover wrote in part as follows you will be surprised to learn at this late date that something had been heard about arnold baxter a man who knows him fairly well met him a few nights ago in owego the news was telegraphed to me at once and the local police were informed but since that time nothing more has been seen or heard of the rascal the man said he was well dressed and had been stopping at a leading hotel evidently he is using what was stolen in owego cried sam why that city isn't over fifty miles from here this is his old stamping ground put in tom for all we know he may now be hanging around ithaca or cedarville i don't believe he'll come here said dick he is too well known oh if only we could lay hands on him dick wish we could tom but arnold baxter knows enough to keep out of our clutches wonder if he knows what became of dan like as not our story was in all the newspapers and they mentioned dan too if that is so it's more than likely he thinks we are responsible for dan being left behind on the island i'm not going to bother my head about arnold baxter put in sam if he shows himself i'll have him arrested that's all one day after another slipped by and all of the boys continued to study with a will once they received long letters from dora stanhope and nellie and grace laning and sent long letters in return wish the girls were back here said dick but this could not be as they had decided to remain in california for a while longer and the boys had to content themselves by sending the girls keepsakes by which to be remembered on the friday afternoon preceding the final week of the term tom and sam walked down to the lake intending to go out in a boat for a short row as they drew close to the boathouse they heard loud talking and then a cry of pain please don't 
came in the voice of a young cadet. Please, please don't, Flapp. But I just will, you little imp, came in Lou Flapp's harsh voice. I'll teach you to play the sneak. But I, I didn't mean to do anything. Really, I didn't, answered the other. But I felt so sick, and I... Oh, I know you, Moss. For two pens, I'd break your head for you and then came the sounds of several blows in quick succession. "'It's Flap!' cried Sam. "'He is beating somebody most shamefully.' "'It's little Harry Moss,' returned Tom, leaping to the front. "'The big bully! Why can't he take a fellow of his own size?' He rushed around the corner of the boathouse, and there beheld a scene that aroused his warmest indignation. Harry Moss was crowded into a corner, and over him stood Lou Flapp, beating him with a heavy boat chain. Flapp had just raised the chain for another blow when Tom ran in and caught his arm. Stop, he cried. You let Harry Moss alone. Startled at the interruption, Lou Flapp turned. When he saw both Tom and Sam, his face fell. What do you want here? he asked sulkily i want you to leave harry moss alone answered tom oh rover please make him stop pleaded harry he's trying to kill me no i ain't retorted flapp i'm only giving him a whipping that he deserves it's an outrage to strike anybody with that chain said sam you needn't put your oar in sam rover but he just will and so will i said tom give me that chain and he tried to pull it from lou flapp's hand let go screamed lou flapp and began a struggle to keep the chain in his possession he struck at tom hitting him in the shoulder then tom got mad doubled up his fist and lou flapp received a blow in the left eye that made him see stars oh he howled and dropped the chain tom rover i'll get even for that mind that what do you mean by attacking harry moss in such a disgraceful fashion because he's a sneak and you know it i know nothing of the kind didn't he go and blab on me to captain putnam about what lou flapp paused and eyed tom and sam curiously i reckon you know well enough he remarked slowly but i don't know anything do you sam not a thing so far as i know harry is all right is he sneered flapp well i don't think so what was the trouble about harry asked tom turning to the small boy don't you say a word shouted lou flapp in alarm if tom and sam rover don't know already they needn't know it all so there evidently you don't want harry to talk said sam suggestively he's a sneak i tell you and you are a big long-legged bully retorted tom for two pins i'd give you a good drubbing hm. do you think you can lick me blustered flapp who felt certain he could best tom at fisticuffs i don't think so i know it said tom coolly don't you fight him tom said sam in alarm he only wants to get you into trouble he'd like nothing better than to see you lose your position as lieutenant he's afraid sneered lou flapp all of you rover boys are mere bags of wind i don't think you found a dick a bag of wind flapp yes i did now you clear out and let moss and me settle this affair between us but this was not to be for harry moss was already at the doorway of the boathouse and now he retreated to a safe distance if you hit tom rover or sam i'll call mr strong cried the little cadet don't you do it said tom i am not afraid of flap but he's so big tom i don't care for that tom had scarcely spoken when lou flap watching his opportunity leapt forward and planted a blow on his chin that sent him staggering back into sam's arms now come on if you dare he cried all right came from tom as he recovered and like a flash he flew at lou flapp before sam could do a thing to stop him blow after blow was taken and given by each of the cadets and tom was hit in the chest on the shoulder and in the left cheek 
in return flat got one in the right eye that almost closed up that optic and then came a blow on the nose that made the blood spurt in all directions good for you tom cried sam dancing around forgetful of what he had just said about his brother getting into trouble that's the time you did it now give him another again the two boys went at it and once more tom was struck in the shoulder then lou flapp aimed for tom's face but the latter ducked and recovering hit the big boy a heavy blow in the chin that made his teeth rattle and sent him staggering over the side of an upturned boat and flat on his back hurrah cried sam that was almost a knockout tom now give him to understand sam broke off short as a warning cry from harry moss reached his ears all eyes turned toward the doorway of the boathouse and a second later george strong the head teacher stepped into view End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the rover boys at camp by arthur m winfield this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by Matt Berard. chapter fourteen getting ready for the encampment for fully ten seconds after the head teacher appeared nobody spoke lou flapp arose slowly to his feet and bringing out his handkerchief applied it to his bleeding nose what does this mean demanded george strong sternly he he pitched into me faltered flapp that is hardly true returned tom hotly both of you are well aware that it is against the rules of this school to fight went on the teacher i know that mr strong answered tom but flapp struck me first it isn't so cried the big boy i wasn't doing anything when rover came along and started to quarrel my brother sam and harry moss can prove that flapp struck me first that is true said harry moss while sam nodded what was the quarrel about i caught him here beating harry with this boat chain i told him to stop and he pitched into me is this true moss y yes sir but i i didn't want to say anything about it sir do you mean to say that flapp attacked you with that chain harry moss was silent answer me he did but mr strong i don't want to make any complaint he and some of the others think i'm a a sneak already and now harry could hardly keep back his tears i don't know why he attacked harry put in tom but i couldn't stand it and i took the chain away from him and told him to stop then he struck me and we pitched into each other and i guess he got the worst of it added tom a bit triumphantly hm, flap you may go and bathe your nose which i see is bleeding and then come to captain putnam's office the others can come to the office with me george strong led the way and tom sam and harry moss followed the teacher took along the boat chain and made harry show where he had been struck captain putnam looked very grave when the affair was explained to him he questioned harry in private and learned that the attack was made by flapp because of what the young cadet had told about drinking and smoking rover it was wrong to fight said the captain to tom but under the circumstances i am inclined to be lenient with you you can retire and this evening during off time i want you to write one hundred times the proverb beginning blessed are the peacemakers yes sir said tom humbly he was glad to escape thus easily for he knew that the captain was very strict concerning fighting a little later the others were sent off leaving lou flapp alone with captain putnam flapp said the owner of the school with a hardness that made the big boy's heart sink into his shoes i hardly know what to say to you your former conduct was mean enough and this appears to be on a level with it with such a heavy boat chain you might have injured moss very seriously do you want me to give you another chance or not what do you mean sir asked flapp much frightened do you want to remain at putnam hall or shall i send you home in disgrace i i don't want to go home said the big boy his father was a rough man and he knew that if his parent heard of this trouble 
he would make him pay dearly for it i expect my pupils to be young gentlemen went on captain putnam this is an academy for the better class of boys only bad boys do not come here but are sent to the reformatory if i give you another chance will you promise to do better in the future yes sir very well then i will give you one more chance i believe you are somewhat behind in your arithmetic during the next four days you will remain in during all off time and apply yourself to such examples as your teacher gives you yes sir now you can go and remember i want to hear of no further fighting and no further molesting of harry moss i'll remember sir answered lou flapp meekly and then left the office and ran up to his dormitory to bathe his nose and put witch hazel on his hurts although outwardly humble he was in reality burning with rage i'll have to be careful in the future he told himself with clenched fists but i'll get square oh i'll get square hello hurt yourself asked pender as he came in yes i fell over a boat down at the boathouse answered the big boy is that so i heard something of a fight and came up to see about it oh i had a row with harry moss and tom rover but it didn't amount to much gus but say i just wish i could square up with dick rover and tom too you said something like that before i'm going to watch my chances perhaps something will turn up during the encampment yes i was thinking of that a fellow has more of a chance in camp than he does in school it would be a fine thing to get dick rover into trouble and make him lose his position as captain went on gus pender yes and make tom rover lose his position as lieutenant too added flapp the term at putnam hall was now drawing to a close and it was not long before the semi-annual examinations began all of the rovers worked hard over their papers and with more or less success sam came out at the top of his class while tom stood third in his grade and dick third in a still higher class the boys lost no time in sending the news home and received word back that not only their father but also uncle randolph and aunt martha were much pleased with the result now we'll feel as if we deserve an outing said tom and sam and dick agreed with him it was on the following morning that captain putnam made an announcement that filled all the cadets with interest you are all anxious i know to learn where the annual encampment is to be held said he during general assembly i am pleased to be able to announce that i have arranged to hold it at pine island a fine bit of ground located close to the south shore of bass lake the lake is situated about thirty-five miles from here and we will make a two days march to the spot stopping on the road overnight in true soldier style weather permitting hurrah burst out half a dozen cadets three cheers for captain putnam called out tom and they were given with a will i am told that the lake is an excellent one for fishing and for bathing and i have already engaged six boats which the cadets will be allowed to use from time to time again there was a cheer and with it a loud clapping of hands while in camp you may play such games as you please during off time and we will see if we cannot arrange for contests at swimming rowing and running and to the winners suitable prizes shall be given hurrah for captain putnam came the cry once more and again a cheer arose when will we start captain wish we were going right now we shall start monday morning was the answer to-morrow we will get out our tents and camping outfits and see that all are in first-class order it is perhaps needless to add that during this encampment the officers will be in authority during all but off hours when myself and my assistants will take charge this ended the talk and the students immediately broke up into little groups to discuss the good news we ought to have just a boss good time while in camp cried sam think of living in tents and having nothing to do but fish and swim and make yourself comfortable sam must be getting lazy returned dick but i grant you i think it will be first class myself 
about the only pupil who did not relish going into camp was william philander tubbs it will be beastly to live out in the open on the ground said tubbs supposing it should rain why we'll all get wet never mind that will make you grow tubby said sam sam rover how often must i tell you not to address me as uh tubby my full name is oh i know that william longfellow washington hezekiah philander salamander tubbs but you can't expect me to say that every time can you questioned sam innocently my gracious vos dot his whole name burst in hans muller it's about as long as a freight train ain't it already no my name is perhaps i forgot one or two syllables interrupted sam very sorry i'm sure i said my name i know you said it half a dozen times billy but you see life is so very short and time so precious i meant to say sorry billy but i can't wait to hear it all cried sam and ran away he is uh, extremely rude murmured tubbs put dot's a long name ain't it said hans i couldn't remember dot no more as i can remember the names of all the kings by england already ah i'm disgusted sighed william philander and started to walk away what is you disgusted about mr dubbs because they won't call me by my proper name do they call you by your improper name asked hans innocently eh i said do they call you by your improper name repeated the german youth oh don't talk to me howled tubbs and walked away more disconcerted than ever dot fellow vos so sharp like a pox of beaver ain't it sighed hans to himself the preparations for the annual encampment went forward rapidly all of the outfit was inspected with care and found to be in good order each cadet was provided with a blanket and a knapsack full of extra underclothing and other necessary things the captain had already engaged three big wagons to carry the tents poles and cooking utensils including several camp stoves and from another quarter cots were to be sent to the camp direct so that the cadets would not be compelled to lie upon the ground now i guess everything is ready said dick late saturday evening sunday was a day of rest for the most part in the morning the majority of the students marched to church under the directions of the captain and mr strong and part of the afternoon was spent in writing letters to the folks at home lights out sounded half an hour earlier than usual so that the cadets might get a good sleep before starting out on the two days march End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter fifteen on the march to camp rat tat tat rat tat tat rat tat tat the cadets got their first taste of the annual encampment early in the morning when instead of hearing the familiar bell they were awakened by the rolling of the drum time to get up everybody cried sam flinging the covers from him it won't do to be late this morning that is true private rover came solemnly from dick i will find any soldier of my command who is behind time thank you captain rover i'll remember that came from one of the other cadets and how is lieutenant rover this morning fine as soap came from tom who was already splashing in the cold water of his wash bowl i'll get a big red apple against a turnip that i'm down first and he began to don his uniform with remarkable rapidity all of the students were soon below and then the various companies marched into the mess room for their last breakfast at the hall for some time to come i see the wagons have already left said sam yes the drivers are to get the camp in readiness for to-night answered his big brother knowing that they had a long march before them the majority of the cadets ate a hearty breakfast 
mrs green the housekeeper was sorry to have them leave and had prepared an unusually fine repast mrs green is just all right declared tom i move we give her a vote of thanks and this was later on done much to the old lady's delight it was a perfect day the sun shone brightly and there was just enough breeze to keep the atmosphere fresh and exhilarating captain putnam was to accompany the students on horseback and the teachers had already gone on with the wagons battalion attention shouted major larry colby when the cadets were assembled on the parade ground and the order was immediately obeyed shoulder arms was the next order given and up went every gun in unison the movement was so pretty that the spectators who had gathered to see the boys march off clapped their hands in approval forward march came next and the drums and fifes struck up and away went the cadets company front toward the road by column of fours was the next command and captain dick rover turned to his company by column of fours he repeated and company a broke up into four abreast and turned into the road leading off in the direction of pine island the other companies also broke up and in a minute more the cadets were really and truly on the march for the camp the drums and fifes sounded well on that bracing morning air and quite a crowd of boys and not a few girls followed the students over the first of the hills back of putnam hall but here the crowd dropped gradually away until the young soldiers had the country road practically to themselves for a full mile the cadets were made to keep in step then came the order rout step and they moved forward as pleased them keeping together however by companies the rout step is given that one may take the step that is most natural to him be it longer or shorter than the regulation step farms were rather scattered in that neighborhood but occasionally they passed country homes when all the folks would rush forth to learn what the drumming and fifing meant they are putnam hall cadets said one farm woman how neat they look and how nicely they march puts me in mind of war times mirandy said her husband don't you remember how the boys marched away in them days indeed i do ira answered the woman but that was real while this is only for fun well i reckon some of those lads would make putty good soldiers were they put to it they handle their guns like veterans the cadets marched until ten o'clock and then stopped for a brief rest near a fine hillside spring where all procured a drink then they moved forward again until noon when they reached a small village where dinner already awaited them we have covered twelve miles said captain putnam eight more and the day's march will be over the cadets were glad enough to eat their dinner and take it easy on the porch of the old country hotel at which they had stopped imagine us going off to war observed sam how would you like it tom oh i don't think i would complain was the answer anything for a bit of excitement the day's march was completed long before sundown and the battalion came to a halt in an open field through which flowed a shaded brook the tents were at hand and the students lost no time in putting up the shelters food was supplied for the occasion by a farmer living near for it was not deemed advisable to unload the cook stoves and build the necessary fires the farmer gave the students permission to visit his apple orchard and this the majority did returning to the temporary camp with their pockets fairly bulging with apples the weather remained clear and warm so the first night in the open proved very agreeable a campfire was lit just for the look of things and around this the cadets gathered telling stories and singing songs until it was time to turn in sleeping in a tent just suited the rover boys and none of them awoke until sunrise soon the whole camp was astir and each cadet took a good washing up at the brook breakfast was supplied by the farmer and by nine o'clock the column was once again in motion on its way to pine island dot sleeping out in der hair vos a funny dings said hans Müller to sam i wake up der middle of der night und find a pig musketeer mein toe already be thankful that it wasn't something worse hans said sam what would you do if you woke up and saw a big black bear standing beside your cot 
i dink i go for mine head quick sammy but the bear might shoot the cover up den i vos runned for mine life und holler like sixty well you want to keep your eyes open for bears added sam thinking he scented fun ahead how vos i going to keep mine eyes open of i go to sleep tell me dot you'll have to figure that out yourself handsy old boy and here the talk had to come to an end by the middle of the afternoon they came in sight of bass lake a beautiful sheet of water about two miles and a half long by nearly half a mile wide close to the south shore lay pine island so called because it was covered in spots with tall pine trees between the main shore and pine island were two smaller islands and there were low wooden bridges from one to the other connecting the big island with the mainland the wagons had already gone over the bridges to the spot selected for the camp and now the battalion marched across from island to island under low arching trees and over ground covered with fallen leaves and moss what a grand spot for a camp it was dick who uttered the words when the final halt was made his words were true and his fellow students agreed with him that captain putnam could not have made a better selection there was an open space nearly an acre in extent covered with short grass and sloping slightly toward the lake at the water's edge was a small wooden dock where the boats were tied up and next to this a sandy strip excellent for bathing purposes back of the open space was a fine grove of trees to which the students could retire when the sun became too hot for them more trees lined the north shore some hanging out far over the water making ideal spots for reading or fishing there were beautiful walks through the woods and in the centre of the island was a rocky hill from the top of which one could obtain a view of the country for several miles around captain putnam insisted upon it that the camp be laid out in true military fashion and two students who knew a little about civil engineering put down the necessary stakes there was a street for each company with a tent for the captain and his lieutenants at the head each tent was of the wall pattern and large enough to accommodate four soldiers that the flooring of the tent might be kept dry around each a trench was dug by which the water could run off when it rained on the bottom pine boughs were strewn giving a delicious smell to the interior the smell of pine is very good for a cold in the head said major larry to dick my sister always uses a pillow filled with pine needles for that purpose the students worked hard that evening getting their tents ready for occupancy and as a consequence all were glad to retire when the proper time came captain putnam had expected that there would be some skylarking but he was mistaken that was to come later when the lads felt more rested End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the rover boys in camp by arthur m wimfield this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter sixteen the first day on pine island can anybody tell me where the um, looking glass is it was william philander tubbs who asked the question he stood in the middle of one of the tents gazing helplessly about him beastly way to live really now it is he continued how is a fellow to arrange his toilet without a glass better run down to the lake and look into the water suggested sam who occupied a cot in the tent look into the water beastly murmured tubbs really now this isn't like home is it he continued it suits me well enough went on sam leaping up and beginning to dress you'll get used to it before long never my dear boy never as tubbs spoke he began to put on his coat but failed to get either of his hands further than the elbows of the sleeves what's the matter with this coat he ejaculated well i declare what's up now asked another cadet somebody has gone and sewed up the sleeves there was a roar of laughter at this mustn't mind a little thing like that said sam and he sat down on the edge of his cot to put on his shoes great scott what's this 
he had forced his foot into one shoe and now withdrew it covered with soft soap ha ha roared tubbs rather fancy the laugh is on you now rover that's a fact muttered sam and began to clean out the shoe as quickly as he could several other small jokes had been played showing that the cadets were tuning up as major larry expressed it i guess i'll have my hands full before the week is out he said to dick in private keeping order will be no fool of a job well you must remember that you like to have your fling too when you were a private major answered the captain of company a the cooking detail were already preparing breakfast and the aroma of hot coffee floated throughout the camp immediately after roll call breakfast was served of fruit fish eggs bread and coffee and the cadets pitched in with a will gives one an appetite to live out in the open said lieutenant tom as if you didn't carry your appetite with you wherever you go grinned sam silence private rover or i'll fine you half a day's pay flung back tom with a similar grin my but we are some pumpkins went on sam squaring his shoulders wonder how soon we'll get to be a general perhaps at the next general election suggested george granbury lieutenant granbury is fined a peanut for punning said tom severely don't do it again and the fine will be remitted that's a fine way to do murmured george and then sam shied a tin plate at him as soon as the meal was over there was a drill lasting half an hour and then the cadets were permitted to do as they pleased until noon some went boating some fishing while others took a swim or simply knocked about as sam expressed it i shouldn't mind a swim said tom who will go in with me a dozen cadets were willing including dick larry and fred garrison as it was off time larry even though major did not feel it necessary to stand on his dignity i'm just going to be as i've always been he told the others if i can't be that i don't want to be major several tents had been erected close to the water's edge where the cadets might undress and don their bathing suits tom was the first ready and with a run he plunged into the lake head first it's glorious he shouted as he came up and shook the water from his head worth a dollar a minute come on in and they came one after another without loss of more time the water was slightly cool but the students of putnam hall were required to take cold baths weekly so they did not mind the temperature laughing and shouting gleefully they dove around in all directions and then tom suggested a race just the thing said another cadet where shall we race to over to yonder rock and back answered tom line up everybody a stale biscuit to the winner and a sour cream puff for the last man all ready there was a pause start yelled tom and made a wild splash that sent the water flying in all directions a race a race shouted one of the students on the shore and his cry soon brought a score or more of the others to the spot i think tom rover will win that race i'll bet on major larry fred garrison is ahead he's the best swimmer in the school he can't swim as well as dick rover i'll bet jackson wins came from lou flapp who was in the crowd on the beach jackson it will be remembered was one of his particular cronies jackson can't swim against dick rover came from songbird powell who had hardly spoken to flapp since the row at mike sherry's resort i'll bet you a dollar he beats rover replied the tall boy in a low tone i don't bet flapp you're afraid to bet sneered the tall boy this statement angered powell and he quickly dove into his pocket and pulled out the sum mentioned this is the time you lose flap he said quietly another student was made stakeholder and each boy passed over his money by this time the race was well under way tom was still in the lead but jackson was close behind him with larry colby third and dick fourth go it tom you are sure to win shouted one of his friends don't know about that tom returned pantingly guess i started too hard 
and soon he began to drop behind jackson is ahead was the next cry major colby is a close second that is true but dick rover is crawling up so the cries went on until the big rock that was the turning point was gained jackson touched the rock first several seconds before either larry or dick came up it certainly looked as if lou flapp's crony had a good chance of winning told you he would win said flapp to powell the race isn't over yet answered songbird briefly hm. do you think dick rover can catch jackson when he is five yards behind not quite as much as that flapp and he is gradually crawling up he won't make it i tell you perhaps he will i'll bet you five to one that he won't insisted the big boy i won't bet any more you're afraid sneered flapp again powell went down into his pocket and drew forth another dollar there you are he said to the stakeholder lou flapp had not expected this but he quickly covered the one dollar with a five feeling sure he was going to win you'll never see your two dollars again powell he said perhaps you'll never see your six again answered songbird and moved away to watch the race from another point along the island shore jackson was certainly swimming well although the terrific strain was beginning to tell upon him go it jackson roared lou flapp go it old money-bags money-bags was a signal among many of the cadets signifying that the speaker had bet money on the result betting at the academy was strictly prohibited but wagers were often made on the sly hearing this cry jackson renewed his struggles and for a few seconds held his lead but now dick rover was crawling up inch by inch he had passed tom who was left hopelessly in the rear and now he was pressing larry the major and the captain are tied see captain rover is crawling ahead swim jackson swim yelled lou flapp frantically you must win and pender took up the call and so did rockley again jackson did his best the finish of the race was now but twenty yards off go in and win dick came from larry colby i'm about used up and he let dick go ahead dick was almost as fresh as at the start and slowly but surely he kept gaining upon jackson until the two were not over two yards apart hurrah captain rover is crawling up don't give up jackson you can win out yet screamed lou flapp go it dick yelled sam go it i say the race is yours cheered by the last cry dick increased his stroke and in a second more he was alongside of jackson the latter made a side kick intending to catch dick in the stomach but the eldest rover was wise enough to keep out of his opponent's reach the kick made jackson lose ground and like a flash dick passed him dick rover is ahead see jackson is played out he can hardly take another stroke major colby is crawling up see he is passing jackson and here comes tom rover too wake up tom cried sam you can beat jackson yet at this cry tom did wake up and seeing jackson floundering around put on a final spurt and passed him dick rover has won the race and major colby is second and tom rover third poor jackson wasn't in it after all End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter seventeen the enemy plot mischief the most disgusted cadet on pine island was lou flapp and when jackson walked out of the water and entered one of the bath tents he followed his crony with a face full of bitterness why did you try to keep up and win out he asked bitterly while jackson was dressing i did try but rover came up like a steam engine you seemed to play out all in a minute and that is just what i did do the pace was too hot for me and i just about collapsed those fellows are good swimmers no two ways about that bah i could have beaten them with ease i'd like to see you do it do you know i lost six dollars on that race went on flapp after a pause 
who won the money songbird powell how did you come to put up such an odd figure lou i bet a dollar even first and then when i felt certain you would win i gave him odds of five to one i was a chump well i did my best honestly i did returned jackson who hated to have his crony lose i ought to make you pay me back i'd do it if i had the money said jackson he rarely had money in his pocket spending everything as fast as received well that is one more we owe that crowd observed flapp with increased bitterness when jackson was dressed he and flapp took themselves to another part of the camp and there met pender rockley and ben hurdy let us take a walk said jackson i am sick of staying around where the others can stare at me come with me put in pender i have found something i want to show you a gold mine perhaps said flapp i need one just now betting on jackson nearly cleaned me out it's no gold mine but it may prove useful to us answered the other cadet the crowd started off and pander led the way through the woods and partly around the rocky hill in the centre of the island i ran into it quite by accident he said you'd never suspect it was there unless you knew of it knew of what asked rockley what sort of a mystery are you running us into now just wait and see pender stepped from the path they had been pursuing and pushed aside some overhanging bushes beyond was a small clearing backed up by a high rocky wall in the wall was an opening blocked up by a heavy door secured by a rusty iron chain that was passed through a ring in the rocks well this is certainly odd exclaimed flapp what kind of a place is it it's a den of some sort said hurdy maybe some counterfeiters belong here bosh you talk as if you were in a dime novel came from jackson more than likely some old hermit lived there when some men get queer in the head they come to just such a spot as this to end their days they hate the sight of other human beings i reckon it is a hermit's den said pender but if so the hermit left it years ago for everything inside is covered with dust and cobwebs and mildew pander walked up to the stout wooden door unfastened the iron chain and threw the barrier back one after the other the boys entered the opening beyond at first they could see but little but gradually their eyes became accustomed to the gloom and they made out a rocky chamber about twelve feet wide and running back in irregular shape for a hundred feet or more at some points the ceiling was so low they had to stoop while elsewhere it was far above their reach the flooring was fairly level with rock in some places and hard dirt in others the opening was rudely furnished with a heavy table and a bench and close to one wall was a box bed still filled with pine boughs on a big wooden hook hung a man's coat so decayed that it began to fall apart when they touched it the table contained several tin cups and plates all rust-eaten this is certainly a curious find said flapp how did you happen to hit it gus i was exploring the cliff above when i happened to slip and fall into the bushes just in front of the door i was shook up but not hurt and when i got up i saw the door and wondered what it meant then i looked inside and after that went back to camp to tell you fellows about it it will make a dandy place for secret meetings suggested broccoli we can come here and do what we please just what i thought said pender we can smuggle no end of good things here from the nearest village and come whenever we have our off time perhaps we can do more than that said flapp struck with a sudden idea what asked the others i'll tell you some other time it's a great find continued the tall boy in the meantime those left at the camp had surrounded dick and were congratulating him on his victory i knew you would win said powell when the excitement was over i bet with lou flapp on the result garland was stakeholder what did you win songbird six dollars gracious you went in pretty deep flapp called me a coward when i told him i didn't want to bet so i had to take him up went on songbird 
had it been anybody else i might have given the money back but i won't give it back to that bully it's against the rules to bet songbird but you are not going to tell on me are you you know me better than to ask the question just the same i am sorry you bet said dick i'm going to treat the boys as soon as i get the chance went on powell six dollars will buy a whole lot of ice cream and cake not to mention soda and candy and peanuts and then he began to hum to himself peanuts and candy and raspberry ice chocolate cake and all that's nice every student can come if he will and every student can eat his fill i believe you'd sing at a funeral said dick laughing i wouldn't sing at my own funeral answered powell and stalked off humming as gaily as ever the remainder of the day passed quietly enough although by the whispering in various tents it was easy to see that something unusual was in the air hazing to-night as sure as guns said major larry to one of the officers shall we arrest the hazers asked the officer with a twinkle in his eye you must obey orders answered the youthful major noncommittally since he had given no orders on the subject he could well remember his first year in camp when he had been dragged from his cot at midnight almost stripped and thrown into a brook of icy spring water and then made to run over a rough road in his bare feet for half a mile just to warm up as the hazers told him it was rough sport not to be approved but boys will be boys and it is practically impossible to stop hazing even in the highest of our institutions of learning it was poor hans muller who was the first to suffer that night in the midst of the darkness for there was no moon hans found himself suddenly aroused from his slumbers by being dragged out of his cot by the feet stop he began when a hand was thrust over his mouth then he was raised up by six cadets shoved out of the back of the tent and carried away to the grove in the rear of the camp the party had to pass two sentries but the sentries were evidently posted for they appeared to see nothing wrong hans was not allowed to speak until he was out of hearing distance of the camp then he was dumped on the ground with a dull thud mine gracious what does this mean and how he demanded as he struggled to his feet does you want to kill me already drawing me around like a log of wood hey there was no answer and now he looked at the cadets to discover that each wore a black mask with a hood from which two black horns protruded who you vos already he spluttered staring in open-mouthed amazement at the party you vos all look like de old boy ain't it i guess i go me back to der camp quick and he started to run hans did not get far for a foot sent him sprawling and by the time he was again on his feet four masked cadets had him by the hands and arms so that he could not get away he started to yell when of a sudden somebody threw a handful of dry flour into his wide open mouth ward he gasped ward do you want to choke me already and then he started to sneeze as some of the flour entered his nose there was a moment of silence and then one of the masked figures advanced slowly hans muller are you prepared to meet your doom was the question put in a deep bass voice doom vat's dot asked the german boy slightly frightened are you prepared to die die not by a jugful i ain't you let me go are you prepared to become a full-fledged member of the order of black skulls not much i don't belong to noddings gasped hans then you must prepare to meet your fate away with him fellows to his doom before hans could resist he was caught up once again one of the cadets had brought with him a large blanket and into this the german youth was thrown then the others caught the blanket around the edges stop roared hans and tried to climb out of the blanket but before he could manage it the thing was given a toss and up he went high into the air oh my gracious he gasped and came down with a crash to go up again an instant later 
then up and down went the boy turning over and over until he was all but dazed stop murder fire robbers he roared let me out quick i was turning outside in already oh stop won't you please will you join the order of black skulls he was asked again ya yeah, ya yeah, anything so long as you lets me town quick and you will not breathe a word about what has taken place here i say me noddings upon my honor ain't it then let him go fellows and a moment later hans was lowered now you are one of us said another student and handed him a mask skull-cap and pair of horns the latter made of stuffed black cloth do you promise to help us anything's what you wants then come with us and don't dare to open your mouth End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield the slipper box recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter eighteen hazers at work william philander tubbs was dreaming of a fashionable dance he had once enjoyed when he suddenly found himself bound and gagged and being carried he knew not where this is awful he thought what in the world does it mean then he remembered that some of the cadets had spoken about hazing and the cold perspiration came out on his forehead the gag in his mouth was made of nothing more than a knot and a clean towel but it worried him a good deal and he was afraid he would be choked to death by it but nothing of the sort happened and soon the gag was removed what does this mean he asked as many cadets had done before him he received no answer and tried to break away from his tormentors but their hold on him could not be shaken and before he was set down he found himself well out of sight and hearing of camp putnam as the spot had been named this is a beastly shame he murmured how do you dare to break into my night's rest in this fashion he had heard of the mysterious society of black skulls before but so far had never been hazed by the members he looked curiously at the masked cadets wondering if he could recognize any of them are you prepared to meet your doom he was asked i am prepared to go back to my tent he answered away with him was the cry where are you going to take me he asked anxiously there was no reply but in a twinkling his hands were caught and bound tightly behind him and a bag was thrust over his head and fastened around his throat the bag was so thick that he could not see a thing before him let him take the cold water cure said a voice and he was forced to move forward it's rather deep there whispered a voice just loud enough for him to hear not over his waist whispered another voice what it's twice over his head was the answer i tested the water this afternoon never mind he's got to take the test anyway now tubbs was by no means a good swimmer and the idea of being thrown into the water with his hands tied behind him and his head in a sack was frightful in the extreme let me go he whined let me go i say forward with him was the heartless reply and he was pushed on until he suddenly found himself in water up to his ankles stop stop he cried in a muffled voice stop i don't want to drown will you obey your superiors yes yes anything will you join the order of black skulls anything i told you only don't let me drown cried the frightened william philander and will you promise to keep mum about what has happened here to-night yes yes very well you shall not be allowed to drown but you must take the plunge oh dear me i can't forward and be lively about it we will fish you out with a crab net but i i can't swim with my hands tied behind me chattered poor tubbs yes you can forward now ha fellows he will not go jab him with the pitchfork at this a student stepped behind tubbs and pricked his back with a pin 
the fashionable youth let out a yell of terror and then certain that he was about to take an awful plunge into some deep part of the lake made a desperate leap forward a wild shriek of laughter rang out as tubbs made the leap he had jumped across a narrow brook not six inches deep and landed sprawling on the grass beyond you are now initiated said one of the masked cadets when the laughter had somewhat died away and at once tubbs hands were untied and the bag was taken from his head well i never he murmured as he gazed in amazement at the brook thought it was the lake front sure as you are now one of us tubbs you must wear these said a cadet and furnished the fashionable youth with a mask cap and a pair of horns we have now disposed of number two said another cadet what of number three number three must at that moment a gunshot rang out on the still night air hello something is wrong cried one of the hazers in quick alarm there goes the drum fellows came in the unmistakable voice of sam rover we've got to hustle back to camp or we'll be exposed right you are came from songbird powell come fellows and mind you don't let anybody see the masks and other things and away they scooted under the trees and then along a row of bushes running fairly close to the first line of tents in the meantime the drum continued to roll and the whole camp was astir captain putnam himself was out and was soon followed by major larry and captain fred garrison dick rover knew what was up and took his time about showing himself since he did not wish any of the hazers to be captured call the roll said major larry after making a round of the company streets but he himself was in no particular hurry almost out of breath with running the hazers came into camp accompanied by hans and tubs masks caps and horns were pushed out of sight under cots and then all sallied forth to join their various commands calling the roll was already in progress all present or accounted for came the declaration five minutes later all present eh mused captain putnam that's queer who fired that gun private jackson i will interview jackson said the master of the school and he ordered jackson to his private tent what made you raise the alarm jackson he questioned sharply i thought some of the cadets were out of camp sir was the answer did you see them go not exactly sir but i thought i saw three or four of them sneaking along near the woods hm. you should be sure of what you are doing jackson it is not commendable to arouse the whole camp at midnight for nothing well i thought i was sure insisted the crestfallen cadet he knew for a certainty that some of the cadets had been out but saw no way to prove it in the future be more careful while on guard duty said captain putnam coldly and there the subject was dropped who fired that shot asked sam on the morning following the hazing jackson replied a cadet named gilson who had been one of the hazers the sneak murmured the youngest rover that's what i say rover guess he did it to get square for losing that swimming race put in another of the hazers more than likely we ought to square up with him for it that's the talk what's the matter mit tossing him a blanket up asked hans earnestly think that's a good way to get square eh hans laughed sam dot's the worst banishments what i know of said the german boy with deep conviction makes you feel like you vos going to prick a bard already quick all of the boys knew that it would not do to try any more hazing for the next few nights even if the guards gave no alarm captain putnam or one of the teachers might be on the watch to catch them on the following day it rained and the majority of the cadets were glad enough to remain under shelter a few went bathing or fishing and the latter brought in quite a respectable mess of fish even in fishing the boys were rivals and a new tin cup was voted to the cadet bringing in the string that weighed the most the rain began about ten o'clock and by noon the water was coming down in torrents this is beautiful remarked tom as he looked at the puddle in the company street we ought to have dug another ditch to let that water run off remarked dick well nobody wants to go out now and dig 
that is true instead of abating the rain became more violent as the afternoon advanced this looks as if we were going to have some wind remarked major larry with a doubtful shake of his head i hope it doesn't blow too heavily said captain putnam don't you think i had better caution the fellows to pin down their tents extra hard it would do no harm major colby then i'll do it said larry and issued the order without delay some of the cadets grumbled at being driven out into the wet but the majority knew they were doing the work for their own good and went at it without a murmur at about sundown the wind fell and after supper it was as calm as it had been before the storm started told you there wasn't any use of getting wet pounding down stakes growled lou flapp he had done his work in a slipshod fashion staying out but a minute or two for that purpose it still rained so building campfires was out of the question this being so the cadets turned in early glad to seek the shelter of their cots and their warm blankets an hour went by when of a sudden the rain increased once more then came a rush of wind that shook all of the tents violently we are not out of it yet it would seem said dick as he sat up on his cot to listen to the flapping of the canvas in the company street he had hardly spoken when another gust of wind tore down on the camp there was a ripping of cloth and a crashing of poles and then a cry for help sounded from several places at once End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield the slipper box recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter nineteen a storm in camp say fellows are we all going up in a balloon cried sam rover as he rolled off his cot in a great hurry one whole side of the tent was loose and the structure was in danger of tumbling down on the inmates heads help came from the next tent i'm being smothered that's blue flap said a cadet what's up now flap he called out no answer came back and now canvases could be heard ripping in all directions fasten down the pegs came the order fasten them down quick the cadets were already at work and sam and his tent mates set at their task with a will realizing that every moment was precious while one student held the peg upright the other would pound it down into the wet ground with a hammer or the back of a spade the confounded pegs won't hold cried out one cadet there she goes in the next instant the tent went flying skyward to land on another tent some distance away it was still raining cats dogs and hammer handles as tom rover expressed it all was dark the only light being that given forth by the lantern which had not been blown out occasionally came a flash of lightning followed by the distant rolling of thunder that is one of the real comforts of camp life said songbird powell sarcastically so much nicer than being under the roof of the hall you know never mind songbird you need a washing off at least once a year replied a fellow sufferer a minute later came another yell from lou flapp he and his tent mates had tried in vain to hold down their canvas now it went up with a rush one of the peg ropes caught around flap's leg and he was dragged over the wet ground with his head splashing into every pool of water that he passed help me i'll be killed roared the tall youth the tent was blowing along the company street and half a dozen cadets ran to the rescue tom with them some leapt on the canvas while others held flap then the rope was cut with a knife w what a fearful wind groaned the tall boy when he could speak this is the worst storm i ever saw oh but i'm sorry i ever came to camp groaned william philander tubbs i'm so wet the water is actually running out of my shoe tops don't say a word came from hans i dink me i have a rifle floating mine pack pond town already of this keeps on much longer the whole camp was in the swim ain't it i reckon we're in the swim already broke in sam some of us had better bring the rowboats up 
the high wind lasted for fully half an hour and during that time six of the tents were literally blown to ribbons while many others suffered to a lesser extent a quarter of the shelters laid flat in the mud and nothing could be done with these until the wind went down it's the worst blow i have seen since we have held our encampments was captain putnam's comment and he and the teachers went around with lanterns to aid the students as much as they could by three o'clock in the morning the storm was over and the stars began to peep forth from behind the clouds as tired as they were the cadets had to set to work to put up the tents and arrange their cots as best they could campfires were lit in half a dozen places and the students huddled around these to dry themselves and get warm i guess this is a touch of real army life said dick and i must say i don't like it overly much we'll have to make the best of it dick answered tom who had come over to see how his brother was getting along how is sam oh he is all right although as wet as any of us this storm reminds me of the one we experienced when in the jungles of africa went on the eldest rover do you remember how it blew tom indeed i do was the answer as tom's mind went back to that thrilling experience as related in the rover boys in the jungle on the following day the cadets were glad enough to remain in camp cleaning out their tents and drying the things that had become wet but the storm was a thing of the past and the sun shone as brightly as ever big fires were kept burning and hot coffee could be had whenever wanted so scarcely anybody suffered from the drenching received the storm had somewhat disarranged the plans made by flap rockley and their particular cronies but two days later flap rockley and pender got permission to go to the village of oakville two miles distant one to buy some corn salve he said he wanted and the others to do a little trading the boys had collected nine dollars from various members of their crowd and this was to be spent for liquor cigars and for several packs of cards all of these things were to be smuggled to the hermit's den pender had discovered we can get enough to last us during the encampment said flap and then we can have a good time whenever we wish and captain putnam will never suspect what is going on it did not take the cadets long to reach oakville a pretty place located among the hills there were a dozen stores a blacksmith shop two churches and perhaps fifty houses beyond were farms in a state of high cultivation showing that the inhabitants of that section were thrifty people this town is about as slow as cedarville observed pender as they walked up the single street how folks can idle their lives away in such a place is what gets me they don't know anything of the joys of city life returned flap some of these people have never seen the inside of a real theatre as might be expected the unworthy cadets lost no time in entering one of the taverns located in oakville and here flap treated then after cigars or cigarettes had been lit they proceeded to buy the things desired for the den laying in quite a stock ain't ye said the tavern keeper oh we are getting this for the whole crowd replied pender carelessly but say he asked suddenly what is it we don't want you to say anything about our buying this stuff all right i'll be mum answered the tavern keeper from the tavern they proceeded to the general store where they purchased the packs of cards and a few other things while they were making their purchases two girls came in with a market basket between them one was tall and thin and the other short and rather stout yet the girls looked very much alike and were noticeably pretty fine girls whispered flap to rockley nudging his companion in the ribs yes was the answer and rockley began to smile openly on the new arrivals as the girls did not appear to notice this he drew closer and tipped his hat fine day after the storm he said smoothly yes very said the taller of the girls and turned away i suppose you belong in oakville put in lou flap to the smaller girl yes answered the girl and turned away to join her companion we are up to the camp on pine island went on rockley following the girls up have you ever been there once said the taller girl and began to purchase some articles from the clerk behind the counter you ought to come and take a look at our camp 
continued flapp it's a real interesting sight all the girls are welcome said pender feeling he must say something we'd be willing to show you the way at any time added rockley and placed his hand on the arm of one of the girls please let me be said the girl and walked away a moment later she left the store and her companion went with her my but they were shy laughed pender rockley you didn't make any impression at all nor you either flap <laughs> wonder who they are murmured lou flap let's ask the storekeeper and find out those girls are twins said the proprietor of the establishment twins cried rockley they didn't look it not by their difference in sizes but they did in looks said pender what are their names the tall one is alice staton and the other is helen staton their father is the local constable although he runs a big farm for a living do they come here often pretty often but they are very shy girls and don't hardly speak to anybody they are both studying to be school teachers in the meantime helen staton and her sister alice were hurrying down the main street of oakville with flushed cheeks i don't think those cadets were very nice said helen certainly they were not very good-looking replied alice and i thought they smelt a little of liquor the idea of their saying they would show us the way to the camp i guess papa can drive us there if we want to go i'd like to see it but i shouldn't want to go with those boys went on alice perhaps papa can take us said helen but come we promised mamma we'd hurry back as soon as we could to get home the two girls had to walk for a considerable distance along the road leading to bass lake on the way they passed the farm of one isaac clem a man who took great pride in his poultry and his cattle clem had forty cows and two bulls which were worth a good deal of money one of the bulls a black vicious-looking fellow was tied up in a small lot at the corner of the farm the girls were just walking past this lot when helen happened to glance over her shoulder and set up a cry of alarm oh alice mr clem's black bull is loose where helen queried her twin sister there he is at the fence see he is trying to get over the fence she mentioned was of stones piled loosely one on top of the other the bull was striking at the stones with his front hoofs soon some came down and then the animal leapt out into the roadway then he gave a snort and looked at the girls curiously now as ill luck would have it each of the twins wore a red shirtwaist this color enraged the bull and with a wild snort he lowered his horns and rushed at the pair as if to gore them through and through End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this librivox recording is in the public domain reading from emperor chapter twenty the rover boys and the bull about an hour after lou flapp and his cronies left camp dick rover and his brothers received permission to do likewise let us go to the village suggested tom i want to buy some cough drops my throat is raw from the wet weather and i want to get some reading matter added sam a good story of some sort would just suit me i wouldn't mind a magazine or two myself came from dick but i don't know if oakville can supply them they were soon on the way each in the best of spirits tom began to whistle and his brothers joined in feeling put it good queried a farmer who chanced to be leaning over his garden gate as they passed why not retorted tom it's better to whistle than to cry right you are young man when one of my hands is whistling i always know he is pitching in the way lay over a hill and around a bend where a number of apple trees lined the road the apples were within easy reach and soon each was chewing on the juicy fruit to his heart's content wonder where flap and his crowd went came presently from tom if they went to oakville they most likely visited the tavern answered dick it's a shame declared tom drinking and smoking and playing cards will never do them any good another bend in the road was passed and they came within sight of isaac clem's farm 
hello ejaculated sam pointing ahead what's the matter those girls are running for all they are worth said dick a bull is after them came from tom my stars but he seems to mean business tom was right helen and alice staton were running along the highway at all the speed they could command behind them less than fifty feet distant was the enraged black bull bent on doing all the mischief possible those girls will be hurt said dick running forward can we do something asked sam we can try said tom get a rock or something and he picked up a sharp stone which lay handy sam did likewise by this time the twins were almost upon the boys chase the bull away panted helen who was ready to drop from exhaustion yes yes gasped alice please don't let him touch us jump the fence said dick quick i'll help you over he got each girl by the hand and turned toward the low stone fence at the same time tom and sam let fly the two sharp stones one took the bull in the nose and the other struck the creature in the eye with a snort the animal came to a halt and viewed the boys curiously he had evidently not expected the attack and the wound in the eye hurt not a little tom and sam lost no time in providing themselves with more stones by this time dick was at the wall and in another moment he had assisted the girls over both had lost their hats and also dropped the market basket filled with things from the store oh be careful said alice that bull will try to kill you we'll look out for ourselves answered dick and picked up a bit of fence rail lying near did he chase you far from that lot yonder answered helen the bull had turned toward the fence and watching his chance dick struck out with a bit of rail his aim was good and the animal received a sharp blow directly across the nostrils then sam and tom let fly more stones and the bull was hit in the mouth the leg and the side he stood his ground for a moment and then began to retreat hurrah we got him on the run cried tom give it to him and he let go another stone which hit the bull in the tail and made him throw up his rear hoofs in a most alarming fashion you had better come over into the lot said one of the girls he may come back here comes mr clem with a pitchfork said the other a farmer was rushing down the road with a pitchfork in one hand and a rope in the other he ran up to the bull and slipped the rope over the animal's neck then he tied the creature to a tree pretty savage animal you've got observed tom as he came up is them gals hurt demanded the farmer i don't think so but they are pretty well out of breath and scared don't know how the pesky crib got loose said isaac clem first thing i see he was after them gals lickety split i was out haying and i didn't wait but picked up a pitchfork and a rope and run the girls lost their hats said sam who had also come up yes they're in the road up yonder along with the basket of stuff they had let us get the things said sam and he and tom started after the hats in the basket the things which had been in the basket were scattered in all directions and the boys picked them up dick remained with the girls doing what he could to quiet them they were so exhausted they could not stand and each sat on a rock panting for breath it was simply dreadful declared helen i thought every moment the bull would catch me and toss me up into the air he didn't like the sight of your red shirtwaist was dick's comment that must be it put in alice after this i don't think i'll go near him when i have a red waist on perhaps the farmer will be more careful and keep him roped up when tom and sam came up with the hats and the basket isaac clem accompanied them all right helen he asked and you too alice yes mr clem said the tall girl but it was a narrow escape the bull would have gored us if it hadn't been for these young gentlemen the girls thanked tom and sam for what they had brought who be you young fellows asked isaac clem curiously i am dick rover and these are my brothers tom and sam we belong to the cadets of putnam hall the young soldiers up to bass lake yes i see well it was pretty o you to face my bull and i give ye credit for it 
my name's isaac clem and that's my farm over yonder these gals is helen and alice staten and they live down the road a piece the boys took their taps and the girls smiled we are very thankful to you said alice and helen almost in a breath you are welcome to the little i did returned dick it was fun to pelt the old bull with rocks put in tom i'll do as much for you any time and this caused a laugh isaac clem went off to drive his bull home and the girls also prepared to depart when you are coming back this way you can stop at our house if you wish said alice Stetton. it's the yellow one with the honeysuckle growing over the porch i remember it said sam thank you and the others also gave thanks for the invitation a moment later the two parties separated what a difference between those cadets and the ones we met at the store said helen to her twin sister when they were out of hearing yes indeed said alice the rovers are gentlemen while those at the store were were rude two nice girls declared tom how much alike their faces are tom is smitten cried sam going to forget all about nelly laning tom he went on quizzically oh you needn't talk cried tom growing red in the face you were just as attentive as a dancing master yourself don't quarrel about it put in dick good-naturedly you can be pleasant to them without forgetting all about grace and nelly lane i think or dora stanhope either put in sam slyly shall we stop at the house on the way back why not they may offer us a piece of pie said tom i don't know we can walk by slowly they may be on the lookout for us you know once again the boys set their faces toward oakville and soon reached the outskirts of the town they were passing some of the stores when lou flapp caught sight of them hello cried the tall boy i declare there are the three rover brothers what brought them to oakville we had better not let them see us with this stuff said pender hurriedly we'll get into hot water if they do they lost no time in putting their purchases out of sight then they walked out on the street and stood leaning against the posts of a wooden awning there is flap and his crowd now said tom catching sight of the trio we want nothing to do with them said dick they are not our kind at all hello rovers cried pender as they came up hello yourself returned tom coldly what brought you to town asked rockley my feet thanks i thought it might have been your ears they're big enough at this sally both flap and pender began to laugh that's a good one said flap i suppose you used your tongue for a walking stick when you came over said tom it's long enough bah cried rockley and turned away in disgust those rover boys have got the swelled head muttered flap but we'll turn em down before the encampment is over hey fellows that's what replied rockley while the rover boys were making their purchases lou flapp and his cronies turned back into the tavern there was a billiard room in the rear and here they began to play billiards we'll let the rovers start for home first said rockley it will be safer End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield the slipper box recording is in the public domain reading by matt perori chapter twenty one a tug of war when the rover boys reached the vicinity of the staten college they found alice and helen in the dooryard watching for them mamma says you must come in said alice she wishes to see you and papa wants to see you too added helen thank you we won't mind resting a bit answered dick the sun is rather hot they were soon seated on the broad porch and here mrs staten and her husband were introduced they proved to be nice people and both thanked the boys warmly for what they had done on the road i've told isaac clem about that bull said mr staten some day he'll do a whole lot of damage we are going to keep a good lookout for him in the future put in alice i don't wish to be scared out of my wits again 
before the boys left mrs staton insisted on treating each to a piece of apple pie and a glass of milk what did i tell you about the pie whispered tom say but it's all right isn't it yes indeed whispered sam the girls had a set of croquet on the lawn and asked the boys to play but they had to decline for want of time all had moved to the rear of the cottage under a wide-spreading tree when dick chanced to look toward the roadway and uttered an exclamation here come the other fellows now yes and look at the packages they are carrying added sam and the bottles came from tom significantly dick was about to step forward when tom caught him by the arm let us keep shady dick all right tom if you say so sam noticed that the faces of the two girls fell when flap and his cronies went past those are some of your chums i suppose said helen they are some of the cadets but no chums of ours replied dick oh they belong to a little crowd of their own explained tom we don't hitch very well so that is why we let them go by unnoticed we met them at the store in oakville said alice did they speak to you yes but but we did not want them to hm, said dick and then the subject was changed having invited the girls to come out and look at the camp some pleasant day the rover boys left the cottage and hurried along the road after lou flapp and his cronies i'll wager those fellows made themselves obnoxious to the girls said tom you can tell that by the way the girls look what do you think they are going to do with the stuff they are carrying came from sam i believe they intend to smuggle it into camp replied dick and if that is so i don't know but what it is my duty to report them if you do that flap will consider you the worst kind of a spy dick perhaps but as a captain of the command it is my duty to see that such things are kept out of camp well do what you think is best better make sure that the stuff they are carrying isn't all right said sam they may have nothing but soda in those bottles they hurried along faster than ever but strange to say failed to catch up to lou flap and his cronies who were making for the hermit's den with all possible speed maybe they got scared thinking we might be spying on them suggested tom and hit upon the exact truth of the matter after that nearly a week passed in camp without anything unusual happening lou flapp and his cronies kept their distance and so strict was the guard set by captain putnam and his assistants that hazing became for the time being out of the question to pass the time more pleasantly some of the cadets organized several tug-of-war teams this sort of thing pleased tom very much and he readily consented to act as anchorman on one of the teams another team had pender for an anchorman with rockley and seven others on the rope let us have a regular contest said one of the cadets and all was arranged for a match on the following morning after drill the students were enthusiastic over the match some thinking one side would win and others favoring the opponents tom's crowd will win that match said sam what makes you so sure questioned ben hardy oh tom knows how to pull and how to manage the others and so does rockley know how to pull continued hardy and what is more he knows a trick or two that will pull your fellows over the line in no time i don't believe it hardy want to bet no i don't bet just the same i think rockley's crowd will lose although sam would not bet some of the other students did so that by the time the match was to come off quite a sum was up george strong had been chosen as starter and umpire on the green a line of white was laid down and the team pulling the other over this line would be the winner for the contest captain putnam provided a new rope of proper size to each end was attached a belt for the anchor men and there was ample room on each side of the line for the eight cadets on the rope all ready questioned george strong when the time had come for the contest all ready on this end replied tom seeing to it that each of his team was in his proper position and had a proper hold on the rope all ready here said rockley a few seconds later drop 
cried the teacher and down went the two teams like a flash each pulling for all it knew how but neither gained an inch at the fall so the start-off was perfect now pull for all your worth rovers cried one cadet all em over rockleys cried another steady boys whispered tom don't get nervous there is lots of time he was almost flat on his back with both feet braced firmly in the soil rockley was also down and it looked as if it might be well nigh impossible to budge either this is a dandy tug of war said fred garrison neither has got an inch of advantage the rovers will beat the rockleys will win i think it will be a tie said another the strain was terrific and soon each member of the two teams was bathed in perspiration here is where you earn your rations cried one cadet and this caused a general laugh watch your chances tom whispered dick and his brother nodded to show that he understood both sides were glaring at each other the strain was beginning to tell but so far nobody had thought of letting up in the least but now tom saw two of rockley's men getting their wind as it is called they still held on to the rope but were hardly pulling at all up cried tom suddenly and his men went up like a flash down came the cry an instant later and down they went before rockley's men could recover hurrah the rovers have gained four inches came the shout and then those who favored that team set up a cheer it was true the rope had shifted over four inches rockley was angry but could do nothing mind yourselves wilson and brady he whispered don't let up a minute i didn't let up growled wilson it was chambers not much growled chambers i wasn't up cried tom again down up pull 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 down up and down went the team twice the second time hauling the rope forward over a foot then they went down once more and anchored as firmly as ever good shouted sam enthusiastically you're doing it boys keep it up are they sneered lou flapp just you wait and see he had a little roll of paper in his hand and watching his opportunity he blew the contents into the air directly over the team led by tom rover the paper contained pepper and it set several of tom's men to sneezing this trick had been arranged between flapp and rockley the latter feeling certain that tom and his followers could not sneeze and pull at the same time up yelled rockley pull 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 stay down roared tom down don't give in an inch but the cry could not be obeyed half the team was up and sneezing and before order could be restored the rope had gone over to the rockley side a distance of two and a half feet hurrah the rockleys are winning yelled ben hurdy haul em over boys down ordered tom what on earth made the men sneeze demanded dick gazing around sharply smells like pepper replied major larry colby who was close at hand would anybody be mean enough to use that perhaps up cried rockley once more pull 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 his team gave a savage haul as ordered and up came tom's men in spite of themselves then began a tug of war in dead earnest with a rope nearly three feet in the rockley's favor End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain Ready by Matt Perard. Chapter twenty two A Swim and Some Snakes. The majority of the cadets were now inclined to think that Rockley's team would win the contest. They had seen Tom's followers sneezing, but thought this might come from the dampness of the ground. Don't give in, Tom, cried Sam, dancing around. You've got to beat him. Bah, you act like a monkey, said Lou Flapp. Rockley's fellows are bound to win in the meantime the rope was moving rapidly backward and forward once rockley and his men had tom's team dangerously close to the line but tom ordered a drop and there the team clung refusing to budge an inch further time is almost up 
said george strong three minutes more up cried rockley up and pull for all you are worth cried tom pull i tell you make every ounce of muscle count and pull tom teams did as never before and tom with them watching for the first time of returning weakness but the team was now on its mettle and made the rockleys come over the line in spite of the frantic orders from rockley himself to drop it's ours screamed tom and with a final haul brought the opponents over the line with a rush rockley flat on his back on the grass trying in vain to dig his heels into the soil and the others floundering just as vainly a cheer went up for tom's team while rockley and his followers left the field in disgust it was well won tom said dick enthusiastically i never saw a better tug of war in my life i'd like to know who threw that pepper answered tom with an angry glance toward lou flapp and his cronies did somebody throw pepper asked mr strong i think they did although i'm not sure anyway something came along and made the most of us sneeze it's too bad rover i'll try to make sure of this said the teacher but though he made an investigation nothing came of it some of the cadets were so delighted with the success of tom's team that they took tom on their shoulders and marched around the entire encampment with him i tell you rockley feels sore said sam a little later around the belt asked tom with a grin i mean in his mind he and lou flapp are having a regular quarrel over the contest i guess flapp lost some money perhaps if he has it will cure him of betting put in dick sam and tom had received permission to go to the upper end of the lake in one of the rowboats on the following afternoon songbird powell and fred garrison went along and all took their fishing outfits and plenty of bait bring home a nice mess of fish said dick on parting with his brothers sorry i can't go with you oh you'll have company enough declared sam i heard that some of the country folks are going to visit the encampment today and perhaps those staten girls will be among them the four boys were soon on the way two rowing at a time the weather was ideal and the water as smooth as that of a mill pond what a beautiful spot this is declared fred as they glided long i'm sure captain putnam could not have selected a better i have already gotten some splendid pictures returned powell who possessed a good snapshot camera now lying on the stern seat of the boat i'm going to take some more pictures to-day on the way to the upper end of the lake sam did a little fishing and brought in one bass of fair size this makes a fellow feel like a true poet murmured powell gazing dreamily at the water and then he went on i love to glide by the green-clad side of the glassy lake and there to take my ease with book or line and hook and spend the day far far away from care and toil on nature's soil just listen to songbird cried tom he grinds it out like a regular sausage-making machine and then he went on gaily i love to swim in nature's soil by the green-clad side of a mountain wide and there to bake my little toes on a garden rose and take a hose and wet the lake with a hot snowflake in the middle of june if that isn't too soon and sail to the moon in a big balloon oh tom let up roared fred talk about a sausage-making machine and when in the moon i drive a stake and tie my lake fast to a star or a trolley car then jump in a sack and ride right back to where you belong and stop that song finished sam oh but that's the worst yet shall we duck him fred no don't pollute the water answered garrison he ought to be ducked came from powell in disgust whenever i have a poetic streak it's catching as the flypaper said to the fly finished tom let's call it square and take a new tack who's in for a swim when we reach the end of the lake i am was the united cry from the others they were passing several small islands and now came to another turn in bass lake just beyond this was a small sandy beach backed up by a mass of rocks and brushwood that looks like a good place for a swim said powell forgetting all about his so-called poetry suits me 
returned tom let's pull ashore and tie the boat fast and and i'll put up a peanut reward for the first fellow in finished red caught you that time tom just as you caught songbird with his doggerel as happy as any boys could be the four cadets tied up their boat in doing this one started to splash in the water followed by another and as a consequence before the cutting up came to a finish the seats of the craft were pretty well wetted never mind said tom they'll soon dry in the sun we can put our clothes on the rocks the boys were soon in the water and having a most glorious time the lake was fairly deep off the end of the boat and here they took turns at diving fred and songbird also went in for a race the former coming in only a few feet ahead i guess we had better dress now and try our hand at fishing said sam after nearly an hour had passed one more dive cried tom and took one full of grace to the very bottom of the lake as tom came up to the surface he heard a cry from sam quickly followed by a yell from fred what's up he called out swimming toward the shore land on the boat tom cried sam and leapt into the craft followed by fred and powell all right but what is wrong asked tom and climbed tip over the stern we can't get our clothes why not look for yourself tom looked and gave a low whistle of astonishment and not without good reason for there on the rocks where they had left their garments rested a big black snake this is interesting truly murmured the boy gazing at his companions in dismay i'm going to get a rock and throw it at the snake said sam a stone was close to the boat and watching his chance he picked it up and threw it at the reptile the snake darted to one side it was merely grazed by the rock and now it hissed viciously the hiss appeared to be a signal and in a moment more another snake and then another appeared until fully a dozen reptiles each a yard or more in length covered the rocks where all of the cadets wearing apparel rested End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the rover boys in camp by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter twenty three a glimpse of an old enemy we are in a pickle now and no mistake groaned fred garrison he hated snakes as much as he did poison it's certainly bad declared songbird powell i wonder what we had best do has anybody got a pistol nobody had nor was there any weapon handy outside of a jackknife and a fishing rod if we only had a shotgun sighed sam but we haven't one and we must do the best we can without it answered tom songbird supposing you try to charm them with some of that soothing poetry of yours or take a picture of them this is no joke growled powell i want my clothes well go ahead and take em i shan't stop you i'm going to get another rock said sam let us all get stones suggested tom then we can throw together this was thought to be a good idea and soon the stones were secured and each cadet took careful aim three of the snakes were hit one quite seriously these retreated but the other snakes remained as defiant as ever there must be a nest under the rocks said tom were that not so i am sure the snakes would leave at once i've got another idea cried fred why didn't we think of it before i haven't thought of it yet fred grinned tom what is it let us take our fishing rods and tie one fast to another then we can turn the boat around and go fishing on the rocks for our clothes that's the talk rejoined powell a good idea fred three of the rods were pieced together making a fishing pole over thirty feet long the boat was then swung around and while two kept their craft in place the others went fishing for the clothing the task was not so easy as it looked and the snakes whipped around and hissed in a most alarming fashion more than once they had a coat or other garment on the pole only to drop it again but they persevered and soon had everything on board but fred's shirt and one of tom's shoes here comes the shirt 
cried tom at last and landed the garment in the bow of the rowboat and a snake with it screamed sam look out everybody sam was right the snake was there and in a trice was whipping around under the seat stamp on him fred cried tom and garrison who had his shoes on did so then tom caught the reptile by the tail and flung it into the lake after this there was but little trouble in getting the remaining shoe and with this aboard they sent the rowboat out into the lake and lost no time in finishing their dressing this was a truly horrible experience was sam's comment after the excitement had died down gracious i feel as if the snakes were crawling around me this minute don't say that said fred with a shudder you make me feel as if there was another snake in my shirt the best thing to do is to forget the snakes put in songbird powell let us row around to the other side of the lake all were willing and soon the vicinity was left far behind then they came to where a fair-sized brook flowed into bass lake and here they came to anchor and began to fish while powell took several photographs i have always found it good fishing near a brook like that said tom the fish come around looking for food from the brook tom's remark was evidently true for in less than an hour each of the boys had a good-sized string of fish to his credit in the excitement of the sport the cadets forgot all about the adventure with the snakes nor did they pay much attention to the flight of time until fred garrison glanced at his watch gee christopher he ejaculated what time is it asked powell half past four and we promised to be back at five thirty put in sam we'll have to hustle fellows oh we can get back in an hour easily enough put in tom but we've got to clean out the boat and clean up ourselves came from fred come fellows wind up and put away your hooks and poles he started and the others followed then fred and powell took the oars and the return to camp was begun not caring to go back the same way they had come they sped along the opposite shore of the lake where were located several coves and cliffs of rock this is as pretty as the other shore remarked songbird and he began oh dreamy days in summer time when purling brooks and shady nooks if you start up again i'll jump overboard interrupted tom do so you need a cooling off grunted powell but that was the end of the poetry for the time being they were just passing one of the coves when they caught sight of a man sitting on an overhanging tree fishing hello what luck cried fred good-naturedly fair was a somewhat surly answer then as the man caught sight of the others in the boat he turned his head away that fellow looks familiar to me ejaculated sam in sudden and strong excitement and he looks familiar to me too exclaimed tom do you think it is arnold baxter if it isn't it's his double went on tom row the boat over quick boys who is this arnold baxter the father of dan baxter questioned fred the same fred the fellow who escaped from prison or the hospital asked powell that's the chap without delay the rowboat was turned in toward the overhanging tree scarcely had this been done when the fisherman pulled in his line with all speed took up his string of fish and ran into the bushes between two cliffs of rocks he is getting out and in a hurry too said fred hi there stop we want to talk to you sang out tom at the top of his lungs ain't got time roared back the strange fisherman and on the instant he was gone it must have been arnold baxter beyond a doubt said sam if it was what is he doing here questioned his brother he's keeping out of the reach of the law answered powell i suppose he thought he was perfectly safe in such an out-of-the-way place as this and he was fishing just to kill time put in fred i'd like to go after him and make sure went on tom what do you say sam i am with you but we may be late began fred oh captain putnam will excuse us when i tell him what delayed us the rowboat soon reached the shore and sam and tom leapt to the brushwood where the trail of the vanished fisherman was plainly to be seen it was decided that fred and powell should remain in charge of the rowboat so that nobody might come and make off with the craft leaving their fishing outfits behind them 
the two rover boys struck out through the bushes and soon gained a narrow forest path running through the woods that skirted this section of fast lake i wish we could catch baxter said tom on the way it would be a feather in our cap sam we must be careful more than likely he is armed and he won't hesitate to shoot if he is cornered oh i know that the most we can do is to follow him until we reach some place where we can summon assistance the path led deeper and deeper into the woods and then along a fair-sized brook they kept their eyes wide open but could see nothing excepting a number of birds and an occasional squirrel or chipmunk once they heard the distant bark of a fox and this was the only sound that broke the stillness it's rather a lonely place said sam after a silence lasting several minutes i must say i shouldn't like to meet arnold baxter here alone for all we know he may be watching us from behind some tree several times they got down to examine the path footprints could be seen quite plainly but neither of the boys was expert enough at trailing to tell whether these prints had been made recently or not it would take an indian scout to make sure of these footmarks said tom they are beyond me let us go a bit further returned his brother then if we don't see anything we may as well go back to the lake hark they listened intently and at a distance heard a crashing in the brushwood that sounded as if somebody had jumped across the brook tom just what i should say sam come on again they went forward a distance of thirty or forty yards at this point the path seemed to dwindle down to little or nothing we have come to the end of the trail was tom's comment as he gazed around sharply do you see anything where it is brother nothing much one or two of the bushes over yonder seem to be brushed aside and broken what do you think we had best do now listen both remained silent for several minutes but nothing out of the ordinary reached their ears we may as well give it up sam it is growing dark and there is no telling where this search would lead us we might even get lost in the woods they retraced their steps as quickly as they could to where they had left the rowboat what luck queried fred none he got away from us it's too bad said powell and then the return to the camp was made without further delay End of chapter twenty three